the South African government, for some odd reason, had ignored the, my letter where I I warned. I I I didn't have any uh, sort of uh, premonition, although I I felt there was something in the air. Uh, but when it happened, when June the 16th happened in 1976, it caught most of us really by surprise. We, we hadn't expected that our young people uh, would have had the courage. She Bantu Education had hoped that it was going to turn them into docile creatures, uh, kowtowing, uh, to to the white person um, and and not being able to say boo to a goose kind of thing you know uh, and um, and it was a it, it, it was an amazing uh, event when these school kids uh, came out and said they they were refusing to be taught um, in the medium of Afrikaans. Uh, that was that was really symbolic of all of the oppression. Afrikaans was the language they felt of the oppressor, and and uh, protesting against Afrikaans was really protesting against the whole system of injustice and oppression, where black people's dignity was rubbed in the dust and trodden underfoot uh, carelessly. Uh, and, and South Africa never became the same. We knew it was not going to ever to be the same again. And the, these young people were amazing. They really were amazing. I, I recall that on, an, on one or two occasions I, I, I spoke to some of them and said, you know, are you aware that if you if you continue to behave, behave in this way, they will turn their dogs on you, they will whip you, they may detain you without trial, they will torture you in their jails, and they may even kill you. And, and it was almost like bravado on the part of these kids because almost all of them said, so what, it doesn't matter. If, if that happens to me, as long as it contributes to our struggle for freedom. And I think 1994, when Nelson Mandela was uh, inaugurated as the, as the first uh, democratically elected president, vindicated them. It was the vindication of those 1977 remarkable kids. Many of us had moments when we doubted that um, apartheid would be uh, defeated, certainly not in, a, in, in our lifetime. But I, I, I never had that sense. Uh, I knew uh, in, in a way that was unshakable. Because you see, when you looked at something like Good Friday, and so God did on the cross. Nothing could have been more hopeless than Good Friday. And then Easter happens. And one more, you know, uh, death is done to death. Uh, and, and, and Jesus uh, breaks the shackles of, of, of death and devastation, uh, of darkness, of evil. And from that moment on, you say, all of us are constrained to be prisoners of hope. I mean, if, if, if God could do this with, with that utterly devastating thing, uh, the desolation of a Good Friday of a cross, well, what could stop God then from, from bringing good out of this great evil of apartheid. And so I, I was, I, 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 I never sort of doubted that ultimately 
uh, we were we were going to be free because ultimately I knew there was no way in which a lie could prevail over the truth, uh, darkness over light, death over life. And actually now, having had the advantage of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and being able to look at some of the uh, records uh, of, of, of what the apartheid government was doing, the, the thing that is surprising to me is why so many of us survived. I mean, how is it that they did not assassinate more of us? Uh, and and it, 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 it is, a, in a sense, a mystery, unless, of course, you say, well, <laughs> God, God, God does have very strange ways of working. <laughs> um, because, I mean, they could have, you know, I mean, people say, well, maybe you were saved by the fact that you were in the church and you, and, and I believe that that is true. I really would get mad with God. I would say, I mean, you, how in the name of everything that is good can you allow this or that to happen? But I didn't doubt that ultimately, uh, good, right, justice would prevail. That I, I said. There were times, of course, when you had to almost sort of whistle in the dark um, when you, you wished you could say to God, God, we know you are running the show, uh, but why don't you make it slightly more obvious that you're doing so? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you look and you say today, there really isn't a cause today in the world that captures the imagination, the support, the commitment of people in the way that the anti-apartheid cause did. I mean, the anti-apartheid cause was global. You could go almost anywhere in the world and you'd be sure to find an anti-apartheid group there. We, we, we are beneficiaries of an incredible amount of loving. People were ready to be arrested. They were demonstrating on our behalf. People uh, kept vigils on our behalf. Uh, and um, I mean, you see it now in some ways. Um, well, even before, before Nelson Mandela was released, <clears throat> in 1988, Trevor Huddleston, who was my mentor uh, and, and was president of the anti-apartheid movement, uh, suggested that young people should come uh, as it were, on a kind of pilgrimage uh, which would culminate in Hyde Park Corner on the day, or very close to the day of Nelson's birthday, uh, 16th, I think, the 16th of July. And young people responded. Young people who, most of them, were not born when Nelson Mandela went to jail in 1988. And they flocked. There must have been at least a quarter million young people congregated in Hyde Park Corner in London. And Trevor Hudson said, this was Nelson's 70th birthday, let this be his last birthday in jail. Now that was 78, 88. It's not too bad when you think that two years later he was out. Uh, but, you know, here was a man who could command so much reverence and support, especially from people, young people who had never seen him, heard him, seen pictures of him, were not born when he went to jail. That was, that was a measure of the support that we have had. Uh, what I, I have to say, 
really bowled me over was how quickly the change happened when it happened. I mean, how quickly it came. Because one moment Nelson Mandela is in jail, and the next moment he's walking a free man. Uh, one moment we are shackled as the oppressed of apartheid. The next, we are voting for the very first time. I was 63 when I voted for the first time uh, in my life in, 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 in the country of my birth. Nelson Mandela was 76 years of age. But it happened, it happened. It happened partly because the international community supported us. People prayed for us. People demonstrated on our behalf, especially young people, students uh, at universities and college campuses used to, used to sit out in the baking sunshine to force their institutions to divest. And, 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 and the miracle happened. We became free because we were helped. And we want to say a big thank you to the world. We, and you can become free non-violently. I'd seen him only once before, uh, before he got arrested uh, in the 1950s uh, when he adjudicated at a, at a debating contest uh, and I was part of that. Uh, I, I never saw him really again, although now, I mean, our houses in Soweto uh, are not so very far apart. <coughs> Uh, in 1990, uh, I think it's the 11th of, of February, uh, he came out and came to spend his first night in, in the house of, uh, which was the official, official residence of the Archbishop of Cape Town. And I was the Archbishop of Cape Town. He was ensconced with the leadership of, of his party, the African National Congress. And now and again, they would be interrupted. There's a phone call. This is the White House. There's a phone call. Uh, this is a State House in Lusaka. There, I mean, he was getting telephone calls congratulating him and, and wishing him well. And, and um, he, he then had his first on the, on the Monday, he had his first uh, press conference as a free man uh, on the lawns of uh, Bishop's Court. Um, so that, that was the extent of our meeting. I mean, I, I met him in the morning uh, just to say hi. And, uh, but what I do remember is that he, he went around thanking the people, our, my staff, for you know, people who had cooked their meals, uh, he's always been gracious in that kind of way. Uh, but this is what sort of the first time I I, I saw his charm uh, working on people. We received death threats, yes. Uh, uh, but you said, you see, when you are in a struggle, um, <laughs> they, they, they are going to have to be casualties. And why should you be exempt? But I often said, look here, God. If I'm doing your work, then you jolly well are going to have to look after me. Uh, <laughs> And well, God did God's stuff, uh, uh, but it was it was that I mean people prayed, people prayed, and uh, you know there's a wonderful image in the book of the prophet Zechariah, where he speaks about uh, Jerusalem not having conventional walls, uh, and and God says to this overpopulated Jerusalem, I will be like a wall of fire around you. Frequently in the struggle, we experienced a like wall of fire 
people all over the world surrounding us with love. And, and you know that image of the uh, prophet Elisha, he's surrounded by enemies and his, and his servant is scared. And, 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 and Elisha says to God, open his eyes so that he should see. And God opens the eyes of the servant and the servant looks and he sees hosts and hosts and hosts of angels and, 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 and the prophet says to him, you see, those who are for us are many times more than those against us. I have come to realize the extraordinary capacity for evil that all of us have because you know we've now had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and there have been revelations of horrendous atrocities that people have committed. Any and every one of us could have perpetrated those atrocities. The people who were perpetrators of the most gruesome things didn't have horns didn't have tails. They were ordinary human beings like you and me. That's the one thing. Devastating. But the other, more exhilarating than anything that I have ever experienced and something I hadn't expected to discover that we have an extraordinary capacity for good. People who suffered untold misery, people who should have been riddled with bitterness, resentment, and anger, come to the commission and exhibit an extraordinary magnanimity, a nobility of spirit in their willingness to forgive. And you say, ha, ah, human beings actually are fundamentally good. Human beings are fundamentally good. The aberration, in fact, is the evil one. For God created us ultimately for God, for goodness, for laughter, for joy, for compassion, for caring. My childhood in Clarkstop uh, were well, like, I mean, any other black child. Um, we lived in a ghetto. Um, and yet, I mean, it, was, it wasn't as if you went around feeling sorry for yourself. Uh, my father was a, a schoolmaster, and um, I remember waking up one one evening late and seeing uh, the room in which I was sleeping filled to the brim, as it were, with uh, musical instruments, uh, drums and kettle drums and trumpets, uh, because they had a troop of pathfinders, something like Boy Scouts. Um, and it was just wonderful waking up and, and, and having all of this in, in front of you. And, and then uh, I often accompanied my father. I really liked uh, uh, riding with him on his bicycle. Uh, on Saturdays, he, he, he was very fond of fishing. I, didn't, I don't think I liked fishing. I mean, it, it, um, you had to sit quietly and still, but I enjoyed the ride. Um, and and, and it, it was fun. It was fun. I mean, you 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 you, as I say, I mean, you didn't go around lugging a, a deep sense of resentment. Uh, you knew, yes, we were deprived. It, it wasn't the same thing for for white kids, but it was as full a life as you could um, make it. I mean, we we had we made toys for ourselves with. Uh, 
uh, wires, uh, making uh, cars, you know, uh, and, 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 and you really were exploding with joy. And it really was fun. I mean, uh, my parents, my father was a schoolmaster and uh, principal of the primary school, elementary school uh, in which I started. Uh, my mother was was not very educated, but it was it was great fun. I mean, you know, I had two, I still have two sisters. Uh, my brothers died in infancy, uh, so I was the only boy in the family, and to some extent, perhaps a little bit spoiled. Uh, um, and my one of the things that my father did. Um, was to let me read comics. Now, many people used to say that that's bad because it isn't, it, it, it spoils your English. But in fact, um, letting me read, uh, I, I devoured all kinds of comics, um, fed my, 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 my love for English and my love for reading. Uh, whereas I suppose if uh, he had been firm, uh, I, might, I might not have developed this uh, uh, deep love for reading and, uh, and for English, uh, which stood me in good stead when I later went to, into hospital for 20 months. I, I did have something to do. <laughs> I had, as, as, as things maybe got a little more serious. Um, I, I was um, given a, a diet. We didn't have too many books, but my, my father was, um, was keen that one read things like um, Aesop's uh, fables um, and uh, Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare. I didn't read the originals, but uh, read these uh, stories that described what Shakespeare was saying in the plays. Um, and, and that possibly um, was, was something that uh, sharpened your appetite late for, for later. Um, I read, yeah, that, that would have been uh, some of the things that I did, and, and and then he, he 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 had books that seemed to be like encyclopedia, uh, and and it was fun just paging through. Uh, I I recall just one occasion uh, in class, in in this uh, elementary school, our teacher asking uh, whether any one of us knew what. They called those things in Holland uh, for stopping the water. Uh, and it had just happened that I'd been looking through uh, these several books that my father had, and, and <laughs> it looked like I, mean, I, was, I was really smart because I put up my hand and I said, dikes! Oh, and, and the teacher didn't know what to do. I mean, uh, he... He, he was looking for something to, <laughs> I mean, he really wanted to put me on a pedestal for, for, for having been able to know this particular thing. But, yeah, uh, I, I really enjoyed and, and, had, and had fun. Ultimately, it's, it's, a, it's a man who was teaching us English literature uh, in, in what we call matric, the last two years of high school. Um, he, he really was quite extraordinary. I mean, you, you, when, when, he, when, he, when he spoke of, of a, a Shakespearean play, you almost thought that he, he grew up with Shakespeare. <laughs> He was very good, a, a black guy who was fantastic, I mean, and, and gave us a, a deep love for, for literature. Jeff Mamabulu, he was fantastic. Uh, 
fantastic. But I had other teachers. I mean, if you gave me five uh, opportunities, I would give you five good teachers who, who were incredible. No, I mean, and good teachers. You know, people who were dedicated, despite the fact that, I mean, yeah, we lived uh, a, a segregated life, uh, and um, when you went to town where the whites lived, you saw their schools uh, much, much, much better um, in equipment, better grounds, and even more <laughs> extraordinarily, you see, I used to, my father had bought me a bicycle and I was about the only uh, kid uh, in, in the ghetto who had a bicycle and, and you t he would send me into town and frequently I would see black kids scavenging in the dustbins uh, of the schools where they picked out perfectly okay apples and fruit. The white kids were being uh, provided with uh, school feeding, government school feeding. But most of the time they didn't need it. They, pre they preferred what their mummies gave them and so they would dump the, the whole fruit into the dustbin and these kids coming from the township who needed <laughs> Uh, f free meals didn't get them, and so they got them. It's, you, it, it was things that registered without your being aware that they were registering, and you're saying that there are these extraordinary inconsistencies in, in in our lives. But you see, I I grew up in a in a town called Fenterstop. Uh, and today, well, fairly recently, Fenderstorp uh, became uh, notorious because it's the town where somebody called Eugene Teblanche, uh, who headed up the uh, Afrikaans Wierstand Bewegung, AWB, uh, the Afrikaans Resistance Movement, a neo-Nazi group. Well, that was also his headquarters. And, and I frequently said, well, you know, if South Africa can survive DT and ET, it can survive anything. <laughs> but this, this town that had, yeah, I mean, it, it was racist to the, ex to the extent that you know, I mean, all, all of South Africa was racist. Um, blacks lived in uh, ghetto townships called locations and, and, and uh, the whites in the white area. Although, actually, very strangely, they allowed Indians, even in Fenterstorp, uh, Indians could live in the white residential area, but they went to school with us. <laughs> Uh, but what I was trying to say is <clears throat> human beings are odd. I would go to town in part uh, to go and buy newspapers for my father. And before taking them home, I would spread them on the sidewalk, the pavement, and I would kneel to read. Now, this is a racist town. I can't ever recall any day when what should have happened in fact did happen, which is that a white person would walk across the face of the newspaper. I can't, I mean, I, I still am puzzled <laughs> that they used to walk around this newspaper with this black kid kneeling down there reading when you would have expected that they would have um, made my life somewhat uncomfortable. 
I, I mean, I, I cannot understand that, that particular inconsistency. It is just one of my memories that, now, why in the name of everything that is good didn't those whites actually just be nasty? And they weren't. Some people might have thought that I was perhaps not totally unintelligent. Um, I, but I, I, I give a lot of credit to our teachers because although our, our schools had uh, very deficient uh, uh, equipment, uh, uh, that we didn't have many of the things that you would have expected in a school. We, we, we had very, many of the people who taught us were very dedicated. Um, and they inspired you to want to emulate them and, and really to become uh, all that you could become. They, they, they gave you the impression that, uh, in fact, yeah, the sky is the limit. Uh, you can, even with all of the obstacles that are placed in your way, uh, you can reach out to the stars. Uh, I mean, when I went to high school, uh, our, our, our school, did not have enough classrooms to accommodate all the students. <clears throat> uh, and so many of us, especially in, well, what we call Form 1, the first year of high school, uh, we used to meet in church buildings. Um, and it used to be just one big hall where they accommodated four classes. <laughs> so. Uh, you you had to have a teacher who was who was engrossing, because you you could you could hear what the teacher in the other class was saying, and and if and if that was more interesting, your teacher really had uh, his job cut out to keep your attention, um, and 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 we didn't have desks, we were, we sat on benches that were used uh, on Sundays as the pews for the church. Um, and you sat when the teacher uh, was holding forth. And then when you wrote, uh, you knelt behind the bench and where you had been sitting was now your desktop. And so we used to write uh, on those. Uh, but again, you know, it's maybe we were, we were not as politically conscious as um, kids became. Uh, although I don't think that that is entirely true, uh, because we were glad when the Nazis were defeated. I, I went to high school in 1945, um, and uh, uh, we celebrated uh, uh, VE Day, uh, it was it was just wonderful, uh, and 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 you know we were wonderfully encouraged by what blacks were achieving in the United States. I mean, I I recall when I was about nine, uh, picking up a tattered copy of Ebony magazine. Uh, and I think, I mean, maybe journalists ought to know just how much power they actually have. Because here I was, 10,000 miles away from America, with this copy of e Ebony magazine, and it was describing uh, the exploits of Jackie Robinson, um, uh, how he broke into Major League Baseball. Now, I didn't know baseball from ping pong. Uh, but what was so important for me, what made me grow inches, 
was to know that a black guy had triumphed over all of the obstacles that were placed in his way. And there he was now playing for something called Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, I didn't know Brooklyn Dodgers, I didn't know Jack, but it, it helped to exercise what is the most awful consequence of racial injustice, and it is the sense, this demon of self-hate when you have a very low self-esteem. And I, I recall uh, the many deaths we died when, uh, say, Joe Louis, the brown bomber, uh, fighting Billy Corn uh, and uh, losing or nearly losing, uh, we, we would weep um, for those losses. Uh, and um, when he triumphed, somehow it was our victory. Uh, we, 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 he, he was a kind of surrogate for, for us over there. Yes, we were being clobbered here, but that didn't mean that is how it should be. It was possible, as he had indicated, um, and others. And, I recall too, uh, it, it may not have been a very good film, uh, Stormy Weather. I don't know, I mean, whether you, I mean, you, 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 you'll realize my pedigree, uh, vintage from, from the fact that uh, Stormy Weather was uh, a hit movie in the townships, largely, of course, because the, the cast was all black. Uh, and I mean, when I met uh, Lena Horn uh, later in life, I told her, oh, I fell in love with you uh, when I was about nine years of age. Uh, the first wallers and uh, the ink spots and, and all, that, all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, those were, those were things that helped us to know that how a racist society defined us was not the truth about us. Uh, and again, you see, I mean, you didn't sit down and, and, and sort of work this out rationally, consciously. Um, it was things that, um, as it were, you were taking in unaware that you were, uh, but that they helped you eventually one day uh, in, the, in the struggle that you were going to make against uh, the awfulness of apartheid, um, the recognition that not all white people, in fact, were the same. I mean, even that thing that these uh, Afrikaners in, in Fenterstorp didn't walk over my paper, uh, but walked round the paper, um, maybe contributed to when one later on was um, in the struggle against uh, r racist apartheid, uh, remembering the essential humanity of people. I know that for a very long time, my consuming passion, which was uh, confirmed <clears throat> uh, when, I, when I contracted TB, I had TB um, when I was about 12 or so, was I wanted to be a physician. And, and when I got TB, I was even more determined. I want to be a physician so that I can find a cure for the scourge. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I was admitted to medical school. I, I <clears throat> if we had had the funds, maybe today I would have been a physician. Um, 
as it turned out, I, 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 I was not able uh, to take up my place at medical school um, and instead uh, went to teacher training college uh, because the government was giving scholarships uh, for people who wanted to become teachers. I became a teacher. And I haven't regretted that. I've, I, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's just been wonderful. Uh, because I, I, I thought back to my own teachers <clears throat> and, and what they, they had meant for me. Um, and, 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 and really trying to get kids who in so many other aspects of life were being told that they didn't really count uh, to get them to, to, to know that they, they, they really could um, become outstanding, whatever they wanted, within, within reason. Because in, in South Africa, there were things that um, were outside the range for blacks. Um, they were put out outside the range for blacks uh, by, I mean, deliberate decision. I, 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 I continued, um, in fact, I went back to teach uh, at my alma mater, the high school where I'd, um, I'd, I'd done my own uh, high school education. Um, and you, 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 you were shaken by the conditions under which our kids were having to learn. I, I was teaching uh, English, and to think, I mean, that we had classes. Uh, the, this was this was average of eighty students in a class, and 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 if, especially with language work, you had to give kids a great deal of uh, exercises, marking all of those eighty. And, and maybe you taught not just one class, you taught, I taught one, two, three, four classes, uh, two of which were about 80 each, and the other two about 40 each. Uh, but that was sort of virtually par for the course, um, and you complain, to whom will you complain? Because the, the, the government's position was that um, these natives are a nuisance uh, and the least you can do for them, the least you can get away with, uh, the better. But you would have thought, I mean, we were already the pits in many ways. Our educational system was the pits. It was just it was just the sheer determination of, of the people who, well, the parents, many of the parents uneducated, but they were slogging like nobody's business to give their kids the little education that they could get because they felt it gave them a chance to lead a reasonably better life, slightly better than their own parents. I remember that one of the, one of the people who became a leading uh, a novelist uh, in South Africa, Eskiem Patele. Um, he had at one time been a teacher, high school teacher, and then couldn't take government policy. And you know, he went and worked as a clerk at a, blind in, uh, at a school for blind blacks. Um, and, and he was a driver clerk. Uh, I I met up with him because my mother was a cook in the same institution. Uh, and now here was this guy. He could have he could have sort of disintegrated. But despite doing what was a very lowly job, he went on to study uh, and and by correspondence, distance learning. He put in a master's uh, thesis 
and was the first person, not the first black, he was the first person at that university, the University of South Africa, to get a master's in English with distinction. You know, and so you had, you had, uh, you had wonderful role models. Uh, and, 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 and they were some of the things that subverted the ghastliness of our situation. Um, and, and, and so I, yeah, I tried to be as what my teachers had been to me, to these kids, um, seeking to instill in them a pride, a pride in themselves, a pride in, in what they were doing, a pride that said, they may define you as so and so. You aren't that. Make sure you prove them wrong by becoming what the potential in you says you can become. And so I, I taught for four years. And, and it, was, it was fun, it was fun. I mean, it was fun when you got, I taught, I taught English and history. Uh, and and uh, you, it was fun when you, when you got kids beginning to, 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 to see the interconnectedness of things. Um, and, but then I, I decided, no, I, I, I would not participate any longer as, as a collaborator. When the government decided that they were going to have something called Bantu education, an education specifically designed for blacks, and they made no bones about the fact that it was designed as education for perpetual serfdom. Uh, Dr. Favort uh, said, why do you have to teach blacks mathematics? What are they going to do with mathematics? You must teach them enough English and Afrikaans, the other uh, uh, wide language, as it were, uh, for them to be able to understand instructions given to them by their white employers. He said that. I mean, <laughs> unabashedly, uh, that was the purpose for him of education. So I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, uh, uh, collaborate uh, with such a travesty. Uh, but they, I didn't have too many uh, alternatives, too many options to choose from. I wanted to become a doctor, a physician, um, and, and I was admitted to medical school but uh, my family did not have the money for fees. So I ended up becoming a teacher. I stopped being a teacher when the South African government um, introduced a deliberately inferior education for blacks called Bantu education. And I felt I, I wasn't ready to collaborate with this um, apology. Uh, uh, for a, an educational system. Our, our children, uh, the 1976 kids who revolted against um, uh, apartheid in Soweto, uh, called it um, gutter education, and it was gutter education. I left teaching because I didn't have too many options, and mercifully, the Bishop of Johannesburg at the time uh, accepted me for training to the priesthood. And so I came to the priesthood, as it were, by default. <laughs> what did the bishop see in me? I wonder. I actually do wonder. Uh, it may have, there, there is one thing we, which um, made me slightly different. Up to that point, not too many people with university degrees 
um, were offering themselves, certainly in the black community, were offering themselves for training for the priesthood. And so he might have considered me a, a rare catch. Uh, <laughs> and um, I have to say it's been an incredibly uh, fulfilling and rewarding uh, vocation. Uh, God has been wonderfully, wonderfully good. What is rewarding about the priesthood is, one, that you have an incredible privilege of being privy to some of the, the most extraordinary things about people. I mean, as, as they are parish priest, you visit people who are sick, say, on their deathbed, and they tell you things that they probably have not shared with any other person. Uh, you, you are privileged uh, to, to bring the holy sacrament uh, to people at a time when they are probably at their lowest but you also uh, have the privilege of meeting up with people uh, at, at their moments of great joy, when they're getting married, or when they have a child baptized. Um, and you, you know, you are, you are given the privilege of connecting people, as it were, uh, connecting people with the transcendent, connecting people with their God. And in many ways, each one of us, of course, is expected to be an icon, a, 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 an image of that which is invisible, an image of God, each one of us, because we each have been created in the image of God. And so people actually, if they wanted to know well, how, what, what is God like? They, they would have to look at you and me and see us as being compassionate because God is compassionate, as being loving because God is loving. God is invisible. People, people wouldn't know about God except through those who are God's representatives you and I and all of us. Well, you know, when in 1994 uh, he was elected uh, and I was given the privilege of introducing him to South Africa as our new president and to the world, uh, I sort of whispered to God and said, God, I don't really mind now. I mean, if, if I die now, uh, it'd be almost the perfect moment. This is, this is the thing for which we had all been waiting for. And then a year or so after that, uh, to be asked to preside over a process for trying to heal a traumatized and wounded people was just an unbelievable privilege. Um, and uh, it, was an, uh, it was an amazing, amazing experience uh, where people of all races, not just black people, people of all races um, amazed the world with the exhibition of their magnanimity, their generosity of spirit, their willingness uh, not to seek revenge and retribution, but to be willing to, 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 to forgive. I mean, forgive sometimes the most horrendous atrocities that uh, had been committed against them. Um, we would not be sitting here and speaking of a South Africa that is now celebrating 13 years of freedom uh, I think if we had not had a process similar to the one that we we engaged in, it it it, it was not faultless. I mean, he, he, it it couldn't have been perfect. Um, it had its flaws, but it it was a good thing to have happened 
um, for us to, and I said at one time, it was like looking the beast of our past in the eyes, taking very serious account of what had happened, uh, not pretending it hadn't happened, and to the extent that we could do anything about it, uh, uh, dealing with it in that fashion, and then saying we have dealt with a significant part of our past, we are now closing that chapter of our history, and we are turning uh, a new page where we are going to try to walk together uh, as a united people. In the past, uh, we, we were aware of alienation, oppression, and injustice. Now we want to demonstrate to the world that it is possible to become a rainbow nation a nation of all races, of different cultures, of different religions, uh, and, and say it is possible for such to cohere uh, and become one nation. We're, we're, we are the only nation that has 11 official languages. We, we have a, a, a national anthem, uh, in which we sing in four languages. Uh, I think we're about the only <laughs> uh, nation in the world that has a, a, a polyglot uh, anthem of that kind, and, and with different tunes, as it were, uh, trying to incorporate uh, elements that were uh, held in high regard by different different sections of our community. So we we have something that reminds us uh, of the Africana. There's, we, we sing in English, we sing in Khosa, we sing in Sisutu, we sing in Afrikaans, all in one national anthem. Uh, and yeah, it's been amazing, given where we come from. It's been amazing that we should have the kind of stability we we have had. We've got many problems: uh, poverty, HIV, AIDS, crime. But in a way, you can say, "Show me one nation in the world that has no problems," and I will tell you of a fiction. You can't put a money value to freedom. You know, people will frequently ask, have things changed in South Africa? And in a sense, they haven't changed. I mean, if you, I mean, you, when, you, when you refer to the material things, which are quite important, I mean, the people who lived in shacks in 1994, many of them still live in shacks. Those who were the affluent in uh, the apartheid years have tended still to be the affluent. But you know, what, what money value do you put to being free? It's, it's, actually, it's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to, to, describe, to describe to someone who's never been unfree what it means now not to have shackles. It's almost like trying to describe a, a red rose to a blind man, or to try to tell someone about the beauty of a Beethoven symphony and they're deaf. So a great deal has changed. But we in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, watch it. You can kiss reconciliation, forgiveness, goodbye, unless the gap between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, is 
narrowed and narrowed quickly and dramatically. And so, yes, we face very, very considerable problems. I used to be Mr. Disinvestment. Now I would like to be Mr. Investment and say, come, come and, and be part of an exciting, exhilarating process. Come in, come in on the ground floor and see a people do something that's probably never happened before. People seeking to become something radically different from what their antecedents would have made us believe they were likely to become. We got word. There was somebody who was uh, as were my aide. At, I, was in, I was at a seminary, a general theological seminary, and he, he got word from the um, Norwegian ambassador to the United Nations uh, who he said, asked him whether I would be there the following day, which is I think the 10th of October when, when the announcement is usually made. Um, and I said to my wife, I don't think they usually want to come and tell you you have not got the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, why should you want to know where I, we, I will be tomorrow? And it was the most awful thing to have been told, you know, because try as we might to be indifferent it was a lie. I mean, you you were not. Well, certainly, I wasn't. I wasn't indifferent. Uh, in many ways, I wanted uh, to, to to have got the, the prize uh, uh, for the reasons that I, and also just for personal reasons. I mean, yeah, it's it's nice to be to be a, a Nobel laureate. Uh, and, and my wife and I, poor things, we. Uh, we, we, we had one of the most awful nights that I can ever remember. And I got up early. Usually, I went for a jog. I was this the 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 professor who was looking after me said, "I'm sorry, don't go out today. Don't go out because the press was camped outside the seminary." Um, and and then somebody said the ambassador is arriving, and he's carrying flowers. Well, I say I don't I don't think they usually come with bouquets to come and tell you, look here, sorry, I mean you you have not got the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> my my poor wife and I tried to be as indifferent as you could ever imagine, and and the, the, the His Excellency came. He knocked on the door of the apartment and um, greeted us and said good morning. And it was about, <clears throat> I think, 10 o'clock or so. And he said, uh, well, at this time in Oslo, uh, they are announcing now that you are the Nobel Peace Prize winner for <laughs> 1984. And again, I mean, you. You were not quite sure. You pinched yourself. Is this is this a dream? You're going to wake up and you discover uh, you were imagining all of this. Yeah, mm. it was a fantastic feeling. Fantastic feeling. Uh, you, I mean, elated, elated because it made several points. It it was saying. Our cause is noble. Our cause is nonviolent. And it was saying, you people who have been oppressed in South Africa, 
the world is with you. You people who have been oppressing them, watch out. And, and then, uh, I mean, <clears throat> one of the points that the committee made was that the, the award was not a personal award. I, I was general secretary of the Southern Council of Churches at the time. And uh, they made it quite clear that really it was a corporate award. They gave it to me because I think it is usually better than giving it to an institution. And I have an easy name, you know what I mean, Tutu. I mean, any, any, any European can say, any American can say Tutu. Uh, whereas if I mean I had been something like Matashalala, uh, that might have made it a little more difficult. Um, so, and and you, see, it's a fair, it's an incredible thing. Uh, you say something before you get the Nobel Peace Prize. You say something. You get the Nobel Peace Prize. You say the same thing that you said before you got the prize, and now everybody thinks. Oh dear man, the oracle has spoken, <laughs> and uh, uh, it opened doors, which was important for our people. It was important for our people at that point in our history, because we were tending to to go off the radar screen, and and this brought us back uh, spectacularly. I had been trying, as it happens, I was trying to, uh, to, 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 to have a, an interview with President Reagan. Uh, and uh, they were not particularly interested in seeing me. As soon as I got the Nobel Peace Prize, I didn't do anything. I, I got word. Uh, uh, the president uh, invite, is inviting you to the White House with Mrs. Tutu. So I was able to meet with him and to, and to say the things that I wanted to say on behalf of our people uh, face to face. Uh, so it was, it, was, it, 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 was a fantastic, it was a fantastic thing. Uh, I was in New York at the time. In these extraordinary kinds of ways that God works. You see, the South African government had prevented me coming the previous year. Uh, they they taken away my passport, and and then allowed me to come uh, in 1984. And you couldn't have had a better place, in a sense, for the thing to be announced, so that it had maximum impact. I mean, New York, if you wanted, uh, if, if they'd asked me, where do you want to be uh, when they announced, you know, I couldn't have chosen a better spot. Um, but uh, they, they are very meticulous, these people, and, and very, very careful. Remember that the resentment and the anger leveled at the United States is not leveled against Americans as Americans. It is leveled against a particular policy followed by a particular administration. And change the policy or maybe change the administration, and you'll find, I mean, that uh, there is very little anti Americanism in the world. There's a lot of, and I mean, there's, there's a lot of anger at, at, a, at an America that has been arrogant and an America that believed it could go it alone. Um, you know, your, your unilateralism where 
you went to the United Nations thinking that uh, they would just endorse your view, and when they said no, uh, you said go jump in the lake, and you 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 went and you did your own thing, and you landed in a huge mess, uh, and and uh, well, people don't want to say we told you so, you know, because you 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 realize, I mean, after nine eleven, most of the world was deeply sympathetic. I mean, America was held in the highest, pe people really felt deeply for you. And, and I'm sure you, you all felt loved. And you dissipated it in next to no time, you know, I mean, chup, 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 and it disappeared. But it, 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 it shows, you know, it isn't that there is a, an ingrained, uh, hatred of America. There isn't. I mean, people love you. And you can still travel, I think, on the whole, you can travel in most, most parts of the world. But they certainly, and I share, I share, I share that anger um, at, at your arrogance, at your bully, bully, bully boy behavior. It, it, I mean, it, it doesn't sit well. If you change that, you'll be you'll be the blue-eyed boy, blue-eyed girl <laughs> of the world. You might say that um, it helps if you maybe are articulate. It helps if you can be funny, um, it helps, it helps to know, I mean, and, and it's not because you're being humble, it, it is that you know that you are standing out in this crowd because you are being carried on the shoulders of others. You know, uh, you may have the capacity to articulate their aspirations. That is maybe something special you might have. Um, but what is a leader without followers? I mean, you could have all of these attributes, uh, and 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 people will not would not necessarily want to follow you. No, I I I'm I'm a great believer in the fact that uh, everything is corporate. Everything is corporate. And you, as a leader, you, you are one who, has, who, who can coax the best out of others. Uh, what do you say to young people? Dream. 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 Be, be like God. Dream. Because God believes in you young people. Uh, most of God's best collaborators, partners, have been young people. Joseph, David, Jeremiah, St. Francis. They are young, 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 young. And in many ways, Jesus was young. Uh, many of those who have been God's best works, fellow workers have been young. And um, don't, don't allow oldies to fill you with their cynicism uh, and disillusionment. Dream, dream that this world can become better as you do dream. In fact, I mean, when, when these young people go off and work uh, as Peace Corps and other volunteering groups in poverty-stricken places where they don't get any banner headlines for, the, for, for doing the good things. Dream, 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 dream that this can be a world without poverty. Dream that this can be a world without war. Dream that this is a world that will, that will recognize that every human being matters. Dream.
dream, dream. There are obviously there's so many who might say, ah, uh, he's, a, he's a politician uh, masquerading as an archbishop. Um, no, well, I mean, polit politics is so all-pervasive. Uh, and in, in, in my uh, theology, obviously, all of life belongs to God, and you don't have compartments. Uh, this is your economic life, this is your political life, this is your religious life. Religion uh, encompasses all of those. Uh, but yes, I, I wouldn't myself have said I, I was setting out to be a political animal. Um, uh, uh, it, is, it is just how things have panned out that uh, at a particular moment our political leaders were not available. Either they were in jail or in exile or restricted in some form or another. And I just happened to be a leader by default uh, to our people um, at that particular time in our history. Someone said uh, there are two rules in this uh, operation. Rule number one, the leader is always right. Rule number two, in case the leader is wrong, refer to rule number one. <laughs> it is that we think of the, the one who leads as a person who uses verbs in the imperative mood do this, jump, you ask how high? Now Jesus said, in fact, the real, the authentic leader shows the attribute of leadership in a kind of paradoxical way, almost an oxymoron. The leader is the servant. So leadership is not having your own way, is not for self-aggrandizement, but oddly it is for service, it is for the sake of the lead, it is a proper altruism. Now that paradigm sounds hugely unrealistic, idealistic. It's something for dreamers, Nembi Pembi. When you think of our current world as a world of cutthroat competitiveness, dog eat dog, where stomach ulcers become status symbols, survival of the fittest, everyone for himself, herself, and the devil take the hindmost. And yet, you see, if you live by this letter code in your corporation, in your school, in whatever organization, you may indeed succeed, but it is at very, very great cost. You end up being feared rather than loved, as happened with a former state president of South Africa's P.W. Porter. When the knives were out for him, no one, not even his closest associates, mourned his departure. And so they frequently say, on your way up, be nice to those you meet. You might encounter them 
on your way down. And you, you realize that this isn't just something that is idealistic, romantic, sentimental. Just look at a Dalai Lama, a Mother Teresa, an Aung San Chi, a Nelson Mandela, that one of the outstanding characteristics of each one of these is how they have poured themselves out prodigally on behalf of others, of their being so utterly selfless. And when you thought you see that in a hard-nosed, cynical age such as ours, our own, uh, you would be wanting to admire, hold in high regard, the macho, the aggressive. It isn't those that we revere. Mother Teresa, you could say a lot about her, but macho is not one of the words you would use of her. And yet the world has had an incredibly deep reverence for her. She's not been even successful. And yet, people almost universally would say, this is true leadership. This is authentic leadership because she has a credibility that seems to come far more easily through suffering. Suffering seems to authenticate the leader. And so you see a Nelson Mandela who was president not of a hugely successful country, militarily or economically, and yet one has to admit that perhaps we have to say he stands head and shoulders above virtually every other state's person in the world. And you say, why? And it will be that people will say, well, his magnanimity, his, his readiness to have forgiven those who treated him so shabbily. Ultimately, it is that we recognize goodness. Goodness. Mother Teresa, she is good, not successful, not macho. The Dalai Lama, mischievous, and yet with a, an incredible well of serenity at the center of his life, someone who's been in exile for several, several decades. And so you think, I mean, that to some extent, suffering has to be a component of that which goes to make a good leader. And then you lead by leading, being willing to take risks. Mikhail Gorbachev did that with Glasnost and Perestroika. Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk. They were not doing things that were hugely popular within their constituencies. And then, and then, a 
And then I think you have to be someone who affirms others, someone who is ready to see the good that is in others and perhaps help to coax it from them. There was a cartoon that showed uh, God looking at a poster that said, God is dead. And God, looking somewhat quizzical, said, oh, that makes me feel so insecure. <laughs> we, we, each of us, need so much to be affirmed. For each of us has knowing a way at the center of our being, a sense of insecurity, some more than others. And frequently, the more insecure, the more aggressive we become, the more we like to throw our weight about and say people should recognize us. If they don't recognize us, for goodness, then they're going to recognize us for being stroppy. Almost all seem to want to see in the leader the attributes that they wish they themselves have. Integrity, compassion, gentleness, magnanimity, the things that make you and I proud to be human, to say, ah, yes, there are awful things about us, but I realize I am actually made for the transcendent. I am made for goodness. I am made for laughter. I am made for caring. I am made for sharing. And those leaders who, who somehow embody these things show that it is achievable. Yes, the sky is the limit and we are meant to reach for the stars and dream God's dreams.